I'm Kathleen Merrigan with the Sweetie Center for Sustainable Food Systems at Arizona State University. This is in our series on the future of food, in part to let policymakers too here in our nation's capital know that ASU is serious in the food and ag space and we have a lot of interesting things going on. Into that, um, to that point, I have Professor Christy Spackman here from our, I've got to get the name of your school correct, the School for the Future of Innovation in Society. That's a cool name. Um, uh, she is one of about 70 faculty members affiliated with the Sweetie Center. And I see Dan coming in, but I'm going to start with you, Christy, to give us a little uh, taste, if you will, of why we're here today. Thank you, Kathleen. I'm so excited to be here with you and with Dan this afternoon. Um, so I'm going to ask you to come back with me to the early 1930s and 40s and 50s and start thinking alongside a group of people who are making baby food. Um, and just I'm drawing from Amy Bentley's book here, Inventing Baby Food, if you want to go read about this a little bit more. But as they were addressing some of the technical problems associated with making a food that you could stick on a shelf that would neither be harmful to your baby, but would also last for a long time, which as many of you are entirely aware of, is the underlying premise of much of industrial food science, the solution they came up with was to add more sugar and more salt. And this, Bentley argues, is one of the core reasons that the American palate is the way it is today that we have been trained from a very young age to expect things that are very sweet or very salty, but otherwise not extremely interesting to eat or to think with. And I think this is such a lovely place to start from if we want to reconsider what it means to have an entirely different sort of food system. Not necessarily from the ground up, although I think that is absolutely an integral and important place to be, but rather from the tasting, eating, smelling bodies that we all have. And to start thinking about what forms of knowledge we gain when we stick something in our mouth and what forms of knowledge are being obfuscated by those entire industrial food systems and either intentionally or unintentionally as they seek to create foods that could last much beyond their expected time frame. So I'm excited to join you all in thinking alongside Dan through some of these questions today. Thank you. And as he's being mic'd up, I'm also going to call on Angie, I'm going to McKee Brown, who is the Director of Education at the Edible Schoolyard. Angie, why did you, besides the reason I asked you, uh, uh, why did you fly across the country to be here? Thank you. Well, I'm really excited to be here today as well. Um, so I work with the Edible Schoolyard Project. Uh, we're based in Berkeley, California, and we're a nonprofit founded by Alice Waters. Um, and I'm sure I'm getting a lot of head nods here, so I'm sure many of you know who Alice Waters is. Uh, she is the chef and owner of Chez Panisse Restaurant in Berkeley, as well as a food activist who's really been pioneering the way of um, slow food within the United States for the last 50 years. And so I work with the Edible Schoolyard Project, and I'll start with a quick story like Christy did in terms of I was in a staff meeting recently, and it's an acre and a half farm space. It's a beautiful space, um, really provokes a sense of wonderment when you walk into it. And we also have a kitchen classroom where students come and learn about history, the arts, and the humanities in the space. And so we were having our you know, Monday morning meeting, and a young girl named Heaven walked into the space. And uh, uh, one of my chef teachers was uh, peeling a beautiful orange squash you know so she had it open the squash was this brilliant orange color and heaven comes up and she puts a piece of the squash into her mouth and she goes that's not cheese <laughs> and she immediately went and said oh but it's squash and so she was able to identify what it was which to me was brilliant because when you think about the different types of food that our kids have access to she was immediately able to think about the flavor profile um, though the color was very familiar to her in terms of cheddar cheese um, she was able to identify it quickly and then she talked about how it tasted like a melon um, it was a fresh picked squash straight from the garden and it was just a wonderful experience and so um, I'm here today because uh, the edible schoolyard recently launched our pledge to public education uh, which is a statewide campaign um, in California that's focused on providing a free, sustainably grown school lunch to every kid that's um, procured directly from farmers and ranchers who treat the land and their workers with respect, um, while also utilizing the cafeteria as a space to teach the values of nourishment, stewardship, and community. 
Um, so much of this work that we're doing in order to educate the palate of our youth, um, because they are going to be the next, um, you know, consumers or the um, uh, purchasers in our country, um, really connects to the power of deliciousness, because um, our kids have incredible palates. Um, they love food, and the cafeteria is a brilliant space to be teaching them about food. So we're really invested in thinking about how the cafeteria can be a place of wonderment, a place of responsible risk-taking, a place of curiosity. Um, and so that's what I'm here to um, engage with you about today as we listen to Dan talk about the power of deliciousness. Thank you very much, Angie. Okay, so the chef is in the house, and I'm going to begin by introducing him. So today we welcome Chef Dan Barber, one of the most thoughtful people I have ever met. How about that, huh? Does I start out good? <laughs> he is a visionary for food system transformation. Much of it captured in his 2014 book, The Third Plate, which is required reading, by the way, of all of my students. So the plan is today that I'll ask Dan a series of questions, and then I'll turn it over to the audience for you to ask yours. Let me start by saying congratulations, Chef, on an outstanding review in last Sunday's Washington Post magazine. The headline, for those of you who may have missed it, read this, Farm Fresh, New York's Blue Hill at Stone Barns sets the standard for American fine dining. Wow, huh? But I guess I shouldn't be surprised. It's just one of the many accolades Dan has received over the years. He's been recognized multiple times with James Beard Awards, including in 2009 when he was recognized as America's top chef. In 2010, Time Magazine named him one of the 100 most influential people in the world. I know for a fact that he has cooked meals for President Obama and First Lady Michelle Obama and many, many other world leaders. Most recently, Forbes named Blue Hill at Stone Barns among the top 50 restaurants in the world. So the question is, has he topped out? I can't think of any other honors he could amass, but the answer is clearly no. Dan is an impatient man, look at him back there, he's like, get on Ready with it, Merrigan, yeah. who, <laughs> who recognized that time is running out to build sustainable food systems, and he's working at a breathtaking pace to change how America eats. A graduate of Tufts University, go Jumbos, a mentee of some of the world's most famous chefs and a mentor to the next wave of culinary leaders, the father of two adorable girls, and a dear friend of mine going on now 18 years. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Chef Dan Barber. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the product placement. <laughs> Very nice. Huh? Oh, and if anyone needs it, here's the... Uh, spread in the Washington Post magazine. I'll pass it around later. Okay, so I've got questions for you. Did you want to say anything at the opening? You're just I'm ready sorry, to go for it. I'm sorry, I was a little it. late. My train, I don't know, hold in late. So here okay. I am. I'm sorry. Can everyone hear me? Is it all, does it sound yeah. good? Yeah, you do need it because it's okay. being webcast. Hello, people on, online. Yeah. Okay. You, you good? Yeah. We good, Brian? We're good. Okay. I got a bunch of questions for you. I'm going to have my way with you in public. Okay, so after reading the Washington Post review last week, I imagine lots of people went to your website to take a look at the Blue Hill at Stone Barns dinner menu. I know when I'm thinking about a new restaurant, that's the first thing I do, right? I look, I look up the restaurant, what do they have, you know, is it really what I want? But these prospective diners would be disappointed, right? They won't find a menu on your website. In fact, if they actually come to the restaurant, they're lucky enough to get a reservation, they sit down in that, that magical table, they're not going to be presented with a menu. Yeah. You're a menuless operation. Yeah. What's that all about? Uh, so we, we went menuless after a few years of, of trying a conventional a la carte menu, you know, the appetizer and the entree, which just didn't work out for what we were trying to support, which was the diversity of the farm that's just outside our windows, the Stone Barn Center for Food and Agriculture, which is um, an eight acres of mixed vegetables and 20 acres of 
of pasture land for livestock. And so I had this experience, like, I don't know, two years into the opening of the restaurant where I was constantly changing the menu based on what was available, not just from the farm outside my windows, but from other farms that we were working closely with. And there was this one spring where we had been waiting for uh, spring lamb and uh, for two years. And finally, the first of these Finn Dorset variety, 100% grass-fed lamb uh, came through the door. And we had two of them. Uh, and I put you know, lamb chops on the menu. And, uh, and they lasted like 16 minutes. <laughs> and I just was like, this is crazy. And I, I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to, to, to uh, match a paradigm that, that doesn't work for this new reality of, of actually not only not presenting, uh, hopefully not presenting a menu, which is where I was headed, but in not having the ability to dictate an order list. You know, most of the farms, including the farm at Stonebarn Center, just delivered what, what, was, what was grown that day, for, what was perfectly matured for that day. Uh, and in, the, in the, the example of the animals, I had this constraint of having to use the whole animal. Now, we, we had practiced using whole animals, not like this was a whole new uh, paradigm, but it was a paradigm that was increasingly uh, constrained by the realities of being so close to the farm. And so I realized that the a la carte menu just doesn't work, and we needed to go to something that was more imaginative uh, of this kind of diversity. So I, I kind of forced myself to look at each table as an opportunity to explore that diversity. And that's when we started getting into this idea that we would pre-interview the table before they sat down, get an understanding of why they were there, who were they? Uh, were they there on a first date? Were they there for a business meeting? Uh, were they there because they really wanted to explore the diversity I just talked about? And that's how we started dividing the farm because you know, the business dinner type of thing didn't, didn't bode well for the lamb neck or the, or the lamb brains. But the adventurous you know, couple or four top that had waited months to come to the restaurant and wanted to experience this thing which back you know, 16 years ago was, was farm to table and this exciting, which it still is today, but it was, it was the newness of it and to dive into it. And so those are the tables we, we, you know, we, we negotiated this diversity depending on what we felt the, the table would most accept. It was, a, it, was, you know, it was a kind of profiling actually that was often really wrong. I mean, we would, we, you know, the, the waiters would, the captains would have this quick interview and, and what ended up happening, they got very good at, you know, giving a feeling, getting the feeling at the table, but still to this day, you know, there's, there's these mid-meal total changes that, that you meet a table that at first seems very conservative and very reluctant to try anything new. Uh, and then halfway through the meal, you realize that you're totally wrong, and so we flip the menu. So anyway, the, the cooking in the kitchen is quite difficult because we, we're, <laughs> we're calling these audibles all the time. Uh, but. So what you probably don't know is I get to spend a night or two a week in the kitchen with yeah. Dan in his back office watching all of this going on, and you're pivoting left and right throughout the meal because things run out and you're creating new menus not just for the diners, but because yeah. of what's available in yeah. your supply. So if I were to come to uh, the restaurant this week, what's something interesting? Well, that it's might... a, what today, this week is great. Okay, because we, today. Okay. You're right. Yeah. I can't say this week. Cause... No, no. I'm saying like today, like now, like the last, since you've actually been coming the last couple of weeks has been, I think, the single worst time in the restaurant because the weather has turned like this. But two weeks before, you know, there was snow on the ground. So there's just people come in like still they expecting like tomatoes. It's weird. And so you have, you're literally dealing with like the dark clouds of cabbages and root vegetables that have permeated the entire winter. So, but now like all the forage stuff is there, the fiddlehead ferns, uh, the green garlics, the little spring onions, uh, the, the baby lettuces are in, uh, and, then, and then asparagus are here. So... And ramps. I mean, it's it's actually a very exciting week. I'm looking forward to it. I hope you'll I hope you'll be there again in the kitchen. I'll be there tomorrow night. Okay. Okay. All right. Question number two. In the flyer we developed for this event, I used the phrase "the commodification of taste." I didn't run that by you. I just yeah. put it out there. Yeah. But 
I was prompted to use this phrase by something you once said to me. Okay. When serving a mushroom in tarragon puree, for which the ingredients had been picked three hours earlier that afternoon and had just been sautéed 20 minutes before you served it to us, um, it was delicious, by the way. Thanks. You commented that we have a library of understanding of burgers and fries, but we don't have a library for mushrooms in tarragon. What did you mean by that, and does it matter? <laughs> I don't remember that. <laughs> <laughs> you sure I said that? I, I, you know, I think what I, what I was referring to with this library idea is that, is that we have a context for certain flavor combinations and certain dishes and certain expectations for what fine dining restaurant, uh, what, a re what a menu should incorporate. And that is changing uh, in sometimes not so subtle ways. 20 years ago, when we opened Blue Hill, the expectation for fine dining restaurants was lobster, caviar, foie gras steak. I mean, you had to have these ingredients on your menu, otherwise you weren't considered a fine dining restaurant, which meant you couldn't charge for what you were you, you had to charge to, to pay the rent and to pay the kind of quality servers that you were looking for and the kind of service that you wanted to provide, et cetera. But that, that's really been flipped on its head. And I'm very fortunate to be in a moment that, uh, where the expectations for dining are not those ingredients that I mentioned, but, but the provenance of the vegetables and the off cuts of meat that explore this nose to tail idea. Uh, and the nose to tail of the whole farm, so that you're looking at cover crops and you're looking at in-between crops that, that aren't as recognizable and that are a part of the exciting dining adventure. But there's not a vocabulary for that. And what I struggle with, and I think I've, I've talked about this with you before, and what the search was really in, this, in the book that is so prominently displayed next to me, was this, was, was this idea that, that, that as a chef, I'm, I'm looking for this sort of pattern of eating that is replicable. So it actually leaves the white tablecloth cathedral of my restaurant and spreads, you know, democratizes deliciousness, really. Uh, and so how do we create, you know, how do we talk about these, these nutri nutrient-dense, ecologically resilient and delicious ingredients in a context where it's affordable for everybody and where there's a pattern of eating that can be replicated throughout our region and, and ultimately throughout our country? Um, and those are the kind of issues that I think, you know, I'm, I still struggle with today because our, we, are, we are talking about a, um, a place in, in the Northeast, in, in the Hudson Valley, it really doesn't have a tradition of cuisine. It has a tradition of great ingredients, uh, but it doesn't have a tradition of putting those pieces together. Uh, and so when I say vocabulary for certain dishes, I'm talking about being jealous of many chefs around the world who have a vocabulary who are tethered to a tradition. They're tethered to a pattern of eating that, that is called cuisine, uh, that's really rooted in peasantry, that, are, that evolved out of peasantry, evolved out of what the landscape could provide, uh, eke out what the landscape provide, and make it delicious and nutritious for the family and for the neighbors. And that, that like, you know, over thousands of years that spun into this pattern and this cuisine that has sustained cultures and sustained ecologies. In our area of the Hudson Valley, and, and I think in almost every region of the country, you can't really talk about a cuisine that is replicable. Uh, we talk about California cuisine, but I've yet to have someone explain to me what California cuisine is. Uh, it's really a bunch of ingredients. It's not a pattern that, that truly sustains over time. Uh, because the truly sustains over time is the combination of ingredients uh, that ends up being replicable. So, you know, I think of, I, mean, I, think of, I think of all the great cuisine, I think of French cuisine, I think of, uh, I think of Southern French cuisine, I think of dishes that make up um, uh, historic cultural tastes and, and, and flavors. And so you think of like coco vin. Uh, coco vin is a, is, a, is a male chicken. So what do you do with a male chicken? Um, well, it turns out that if you braise it very gently, you know, in, in reduced white wine, you get this magical flavor from, from the chicken. Um, and coco vin becomes a mainstay of, of the cuisine in the same way that bouillabaisse uh, is trash fish, fish that was damaged or fish that was not coveted. 
that the fishermen's wives used to cook at the dock while the fishermen sold the beautiful pieces of fish. Well, bouillabaisse becomes really a waste dish of, of fish that done with the kind of culinary craft and attention that is so emblematic of French cuisine and all the other cuisines that we could talk about today, uh, it lasts through time. And those you put those all together and it speaks to the region, the landscape, and the culture that, that it evolved from. Uh, so what I'm searching for is that kind, I'm, I would love to be tethered to that kind of tradition. And chefs today uh, have that kind of tradition to, to work off of, and I don't. And so part of the search in this book is for a pattern of eating that uh, is replicable. And so I'm looking to create a library of flavors that my daughters can end up replicating uh, into the future. I hope that answered your question. That's a tough one, man. I'm going to start sweating I got some up more here. Too. Okay, but I'll start it. with an easy right. one. I'm just yeah. picking up on your um, wasted food issue. I remember one time uh, dining uh, at Blue Hill, and you were describing how when you open that can of chickpeas and you yeah. drain out the fluid, so you have the chickpeas, it's like, what about that fluid? And you yeah. frothed it up and put it on a salad. Yeah. And that was just sort of mind-blowing yeah, It turns for out me. that the protein from the chickpeas infused into the water um, has a kind of uh, magic to it. When you whip the water, it turns into like an egg white meringue. And so you think about all the wasted chickpea water there is in the world <laughs> and the flavors that are going down the sink. It's just, uh, yeah, that was real eye-opening. So how, how much of your time are you thinking about the whole issue of wasted food? You talked uh, uh, nose to tail. We've got Barry Carpenter here who's one of the uh, the world's greatest livestock experts, um, national meat associate, all kinds of uh, organizational work and USDA work. So we, we talk sometimes about the opportunities to use more of the animal for primary purposes. How much of the time are you thinking about wasted food? I know you've had a big, uh, a big effort called wasted in this area. It, yeah, the, the wasted effort, the, the wasted um, pop-up that we did was was really to celebrate what chefs do every night. I just think chefs get get maligned, unfortunately, for being wasteful or high end. You know, good you know, white tablecloth restaurants get unfairly um, maligned for wasting food. And I, I but my upbringing, the, the DNA of all chefs, I think, is to utilize everything that there is to utilize in the kitchen. Actually. I just talked about two dishes, coco van and bouillabaisse, which are rooted in, in, in soaking up waste. And if you look at the history of cuisine, almost all the dishes are focused on, on looking at at least everyday dishes, uh, not the celebratory ones, but the everyday dishes that become the fabric of the cuisine are, are about soaking up food waste. And, and even more than that, trying to broaden the definition of food waste away from the easy stuff, the ugly fruits and vegetables and the damaged fish, which people talk about a lot today. But, but I became much more interested in how you define food waste. I mean, 120 million acres of corn and soybean rotations that we have today, as we all know, is a disaster ecologically, environmentally a disaster. But from a waste perspective, it's totally disastrous too. Uh, what if we plant, you know, we're feeding that to our gas tanks and to our animals? And the inefficiency of that is startling. What if we were rotating in grains, soil supporting grains, a suite of soil supporting grains that we eat directly? I mean, that's another way to look at the wasted issue. And so that's why we started this pop up to talk about the kind of stuff that is harder to talk about because at the root of it is American uh, food culture that is filled with waste. Because American agriculture, food culture, is rooted in, in, in a plethora. I mean, we, we, we arrived, uh, in, as a young country, arrived in a place that was just like the Garden of Eden. And, and we never were forced into the kind of negotiations that these peasants across the world were forced into, which was eking out what the land could provide as soils became exhausted. And so you had to rotate in certain crops to bring back fertility. And then you had to eat those crops because you had no choice. And that is the fabric of that cuisine that I was talking about, like, like in Japan, where, where you know, it's a rice culture, but in order to eat the rice, you need, you need rotation crops like buckwheat. So Japanese cuisine developed uh, a ethic, uh, actually an imperative to eat buckwheat, but they did it through eating soba noodles. 
So another way of thinking about a bowl of soba noodles in Japanese cuisine is to think about if you want your bowl of white rice for dinner, you better eat soba noodles for lunch. Um, and that, that, that is mimicked everywhere that I looked, all over the world. In Northern Africa, it's millet as the, as, well, look, it's rice in, in Asia, it's, it's corn in the global south, and, in, and wheat in the north, to be very reductionist about it. But each of those crops required a rotation, a multitude of rotations to support that king crop. And so the, the south, it was beans. Uh, and in you know, places like North Africa, millet, and places like India, lentils, wherever it was, th those crops only were, support were only able to, to, to feed a growing population if they were rotated. And so to me, that come, came right back to this idea of wasteless. In America, we did, did, never had that ethic. And so we don't have a culture that eats those soil-supporting grains. And so it kind of feeds right into that 120 million acres of corn and soy. And if we could introduce the, this idea of deliciousness with these soil-supporting crops, whatever they are, uh, we could look at a farm landscape in the same way that I was forced into looking at, at an animal, at a lamb, nose to tail. So it's not just nose to tail the animal, it's nose to tail the whole farm. So, okay. That, that's one way to answer your question. <laughs> that was a good way. Thank because you. Because my next question was about yeah. soil, so you stole a little of my thunder. Yeah. Um, so you state that your goal, among your goals, is creating a pattern of eating that supports healthy soil. Cool. Um, and in the third plate, product placement, um, I always assign my students for sure to read the soils uh, chapters. And you talk about your conversations with Klaus Martin a friend of ours, and um, what you learned from him is not so much about fighting the weeds, but strengthening the plant. And I love that you actually ask yourself the question out loud in the book that I want to ask you. It's like, why should a chef care about how farmers manage weeds and pests? You've touched upon that. But I also, I saw our um, servers uh, about to go around with baskets of bread, and it might give you some opportunity to talk as well about what you're doing creatively in your bakery. Well, go ahead with the bread. I don't want to hold that up. Um, yeah, so... Because, you're, um, because I hope if, if, if the bread tastes right, um, it's a good example of what you were talking about, that you can't get the flavors that are expressed in that bread if you're growing, in this case, wheat or oats You have a and barley. So you have a mix of all of all three, you have a, um, a loaf going around of 85% of oat bread. I just want to talk about what that means for 85% oat bread in a minute. Um, you may have to be like church and pass it across the aisles uh, in order okay. to, for everyone to get a piece. And sorry for those of you online, you don't get to taste this deliciousness. So so there's, a, there's an oat bread that's near 100%, 85%, as I said, and then there's a malted barley and and barber wheat bread, which is the darker one of the two. Um, and so, so I, I found through just trial and error that the best wheat that I was experiencing through the bread that we baked in the bakery was from farms that were organic for sure, but much more than organic, were supporting this incredible soil tilth and health. And it sounds sort of axiomatic, but until you taste the difference, you don't realize how extraordinarily important uh, that kind of uh, energy and biological activity for the soil is. And what you're tasting now is, is that. Um, I, I, it, it, it really started when I was standing in the middle of Klaus Martin's field. As you mentioned, Klaus, he's sort of the hero of the book. Um, and I was standing in the middle of his field I think it was now 12 years ago. No, no, my God, it's 2006. So what is that? More than 10 years ago, 13 years ago. Um, and I went there to, to write about how, with the recipe for how he grows his wheat. And I went to write about a recipe for how he grows wheat because I wanted to write a book about farm to table. And I wanted to talk first and foremost about this idea of buying local grain, which back in 2004 and five was this sort of new idea, at least in, in the Hudson Valley. and, and I was baking a bread of, from his wheat, this emmer wheat, that people went crazy for. They're just the kind of thing. They wanted to sell their firstborn to have another bite. Kind of thing. It, was, it was crazy. And I just thought it would be a great place to start the book. So I went to visit Klaus, and I was standing in the middle of, of this 2,000 acres. And 
I saw almost no wheat. And so what I saw as I, in the first you know, 10 minutes of, of having Klaus point this out, was millet and barley and oats and buckwheat and a lots, and lots and lots of cover crops and very little wheat. And what I realized in that moment was that I was sort of the emperor without clothes. I was sitting here speaking about and about to write a book about the virtues of buying local wheat and the importance of it, but, and the importance of soil that produced that delicious wheat that all my diners were coveting. But I didn't understand that to get the wheat to taste that way, Klaus needed to grow that suite of crops that I just mentioned in a very timed and meticulous rotation. Uh, so it was sort of an art to how he got the soil to get that kind of biological activity and that strength. And when it was locked and loaded, then the wheat went in. So the wheat was like the, the last, the pinnacle crop. And everything else, the barley and the oats that you're tasting, but the buckwheat, the millet, et cetera, on out, those were supporting. And they added the sulfur, they, whatever it was, depending on the, 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 the moment, of the, the season, and the rotation that happened before, it dictated what went in. It was a real recipe. And, and I really say I was emperor without clothes because I wasn't celebrating everything else. I was celebrating this one slice of a very large pie that I knew nothing about. And so I spent the next 10 years really learning about those soil supporting crops. And I went back to the restaurant actually the next two days later and created this dish called rotation risotto, which ended up being all of the crops that I saw on that farm that day, the 90% of the pie, not the wheat and he wasn't growing rice. So it was a risotto of the barley and the buckwheats and, and the millets. Um, and when, when a waiter, not long after I put on the menu, one of the crabby, I was walking by a table, I was a crabby New Yorker, so like, what the hell is a rotation risotto? And the waiter fielded it so well, she said, it's a, it's a nose to tail of the whole farm. And I thought it was like perfect. And, and, and actually our, my, my cooking, the style of Blue Hills cuisine, really came out of that experience. Um, so what you're tasting is, this, is these oats that, that are bread and barley, that are bread and, and wheat, but let's just remove the wheat for a second because I'm, we're leading up to the wheat. The oats and the barley in this case are bread for human consumption, which sounds crazy. But I also learned during this time that the oats and the barley that Klaus are putting in his field were cover crop oats, essentially. They were pig feed oats. They were pig feed barley that 99.999% of those soil supporting crops that I just mentioned that are so integral to organic agriculture, so integral to the flavor and the nutrition that we all want in our grain and in our breads. There is no distinction between a barley or an oat that is bread for deliciousness and human consumption and pig food, zero. So a farmer, an organic farmer are, is planting those crops with the very, very slim hope that they'll enter into the human consumption world. They almost never do because we don't have a culture around eating them. And to a large extent, you can get oats and barley from Canada a lot cheaper and increasingly from other places of the world. So the organic farmers like Klaus are growing these crops, but they're growing them to either plow them into the ground or for animal feed. And so the attention to flavor and deliciousness is almost zero, actually is zero. And that if you're eating a barley bread, if we go down the street to the bakery and you, order, you ask for a barley bread, you are getting something that was rejected from the malting industry for the beer, or you're getting something that was meant for pig feed and just happened to go into, into bread by accident because there was a market for it. And that struck me as just crazy, especially in light of not just the ecological issues, the need to grow these crops on large farms, but the fact that we're being told to eat more whole grains. And these grains are so nutritious. And if they are selected, if they are varieties that are meant for deliciousness, and most of those come from other cultures, uh, they, they, there will be a culture for them. And that's sort of the bet that we're doing here, is that we need to breed for those kinds of, of grains uh, and hopefully create the culture that will enable the farmers like Klaus to have a market for more of this. So that's the... That's the ticket for the future. Seems like a perfect lead-in to ask you about row seven. Yeah. So you have a new venture of sorts. Yeah, row seven came out of that, which was, which was 
the realization that if we, if we were going to use these crops for their ecological value, we needed to make them more delicious to create the demand for it. And that, that was that. So, so Row 7 is a partnership between breeders and chefs to explore the co selection of these grains and of vegetables that are rooted in deliciousness. So it's a, it's a 50 50 split. There's a Venn diagram somewhere where the yield potential and the flavor come together. In other words, if there's a vegetable or a grain that is so jaw droppingly delicious, that it's sort of obvious that we'd want to pursue it, but the yield doesn't work. It doesn't, it doesn't go forward. If there is a vegetable or grain that is, has incredible disease resistance and incredible yield, but the flavor is off, it also doesn't go forward. So it's where the two meet. And the hope is to create a food culture around deliciousness, but starting with the seed. Because what I've discovered, especially through the grain world, is that if you don't create these vegetables anew, you're really going back, I would say the grain world, but also the vegetable, you're really going back to heirlooms, I mean, which is something I proselytized for a long time until this experience. That you're saying that you know, chefs like me talk about going backwards because heirlooms are where the flavors are. But heirlooms are expensive to grow. The agronomically, they're super risky because they were developed someplace else in the world, so you're growing them out of place. They have low yield, and they usually fall apart in weird, unpredictable weather conditions, which we're now obviously faced with more and more. So we need to take the genetics of the past and re re reinterpret them and recombine them and recreate them for the future. And so that's the hope, is to take those, those the, 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 the deliciousness of the past and put in these modern uh, select for you know, regions and, and a modern food culture where these flavors can be democratized. That's the hope of Row 7. So you mentioned weird weather. Yeah. And I read Kim Severinsen's piece today in the New York Times. Yeah, I read that before I fell asleep on the train. <laughs> I fell asleep pulling out of, Grand, of Penn Station, and I woke up in D.C. I'm lucky. It was the weirdest Did the train feeling. go on? Could we, we, we could have lost y'all yeah. all together? <laughs> it was the weirdest thing. Yeah. Wow. Well, anyhow, if you haven't read her piece, she looks at 11 crops that are being challenged because of climate change. I recommend yeah. the piece. And she writes, drop a pin anywhere on a map of the United States and you'll find disruption in the fields. Warmer temperatures are extending growing seasons in some areas and sending a host of new pests into others. Some fields are parched with drought, others so flooded that they swallow tractors. So I know we just left farm bill season. Many of us would say, thank the Lord. Uh, but there's constantly legislation going on, and we have a lot of policy influencers in this room, let alone people who are watching online. If you had a magic wand or you were policy czar for a day, or if you're recommending to members of Congress, what would you like to see in terms of policy changes to support the kind of dietary shift we need to have? I'd probably look to land-grant colleges uh, because everything I just talked about was the job of land-grant colleges. That's why it was created. It was the democratizer of elite education to begin with, and in a world, you know, in a moment in our country where, where this issue of democratization is, is so prevalent. Um, it just seems like the land-grant university system was created, that's the answer to the problem, it's already, it's the, the answer's here. Um, and it's actually the envy of the world. We have, a, we have a, a university in every state that's devoted to a regional food system. And that, as I was researching this, for the book as well, it was just startling to see its origins, and that is in the middle of a civil war. And it was really President Lincoln who recognized that as the country was growing, it was inadequately uh, knowledgeable about, about farming. And in, a, and in a geographic differences across the country, it needed regional focus for seed work, actually, and also just for farming knowledge. And that the farmers who came over here didn't know how to farm. That's why they weren't tied to land, and they were free to come here. And so this whole idea that we're a nation, it's supposed to be a nation of young yeoman farmers was really fraught, really not quite right. Uh, it was a nation of inexperienced farmers, and the land-grant system 
was a way to use our tax dollars, everyone's tax dollars, to support a regional food system. And of course, as we all know, it's been completely turned on its head. Um, and a lot of that has to do with legislation around in the 1980s and the deregulation. And the idea that university ag schools are now funded a lot less and they need to get their own funding. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's operating in the breach. So if I, were, if I had a lever of power, I'd probably restore land grants to their original intent. And maybe do some policies too that would help some of those somewhat orphan crops that you are putting in rotational risotto and cover crop salad. You know, you know you're the policy expert, so I would defer to you on that. But I would, I, would, I would question it just intuitively because I don't know that putting political, even economic weight towards certain crops is, is the way to inspire the food culture. I don't know. I mean, I'd be interested to see what, what specifically you mean, and, and you could probably disabuse me of my very naive <laughs> viewpoint of, of the limits of government inter intervention in food culture. But if, if I, if going off of that, I'd probably invest in chefs more and invest in the idea that chefs, through deliciousness, through, through hedonism, can create the kind of food culture that we want. Because if we're doing it through the angle of nutrition, or, or the angle of, you know, whatever, policy levers that, that I've seen enacted, I ultimately feel like they don't work because they don't inspire, you know, the kind of culture around food that is so much a part of the rest of the world, at least that have these, these thriving food cultures. So, but that, you know, I'm yeah. not here to argue with you. Well, we'll wait till tomorrow night. We'll yeah, do it right. in private. Okay, okay good. good. Um, all right, so I'm going to ask my last question of you, and then I will open it up to the crowd. Oof, okay, good. Okay, you ready? Yeah. All right. So um, here in Washington in particular, it is the season of development for our next iteration of the Dietary Guidelines uh, yeah. for Americans, DGAs as we like to refer to them. Yeah. Next one due in 2020. Yeah. Uh, the U.S. is one of 64 or 65 countries now that produce dietary guidance for their citizens. Um, at least that was my last count. I'm still stunned by what the Brazilians pulled off in their dietary guidance in 2014. Tell I don't me. know how many people I've seen it. Well, rather than showing a food guide pyramid, or the, currently it's our myplate.gov, right? Um, yeah. Which I like. It's nice, simplified. What I they thought you did, had something to do with that. <laughs> yeah. Perhaps. Yeah. Um, so what they have done is um, they, they don't really talk about food groups or nutrients they talk about a plate of food. And when you go to their guidance, it's these beautiful plates of food, um, which in some ways is, is interesting for us. But what's really interesting to me is they um, provide guidance on the importance of shared family and community meals. So this um, clicked in my head when I was mm. thinking about this and you coming here today, I've heard you say that we've become so cold and insular in fine dining that you're interested in shared courses that require passing the plate and interacting with your neighbor. Almost every other cuisine in the world does that, you say. In other cultures, people wouldn't think of doing individual plates as we are so accustomed to doing. So again, magic wand land. Um, and you could design our next DGAs would you boost family meals, neighborhood meals, and if so, why? I didn't know I said all that. That's really. That's, I listen that's very great. carefully you, to you. You listen very carefully. I it's do. funny because that's that's we we. I think we tend to forget that restaurants. Restaurants were invented as restoratives. That was the original name of a restaurant. It was in Paris in the 1700s. It was meant to be a place where you came together and you ate at long tables and you enjoyed this this bone broth, this this soup. That was called a restorative. Um, but it was interesting that, that you came together at a place. It's the first, it was the first restaurant. Before that, there were like these salons, which were where women weren't allowed to go, and it was pretty raucous affairs. But the, the first restaurant was really meant in this age of enlightenment to be a healthful restorative, which, which for the French meant not just a, a, a delicious bowl of soup, but to be enjoyed in in, in and around other people, uh, uh, strangers, which I found fascinating. And that, we've, that it, restaurants today have gotten so far away from that. Uh, and, and, and I would like to return to more of that, even in the context of, of our, our Blue Hill. 
and how to do that is, is, is sort of tricky. But I think, I think sharing, you know, instead of individually plating plates of food, like we, ought, we, we do every other course that's shared. So you're forced into reaching across and, and, and having a different interaction with food, which I think is fabulous. But your question was, was what would I do, again, on the, on the federal level to influence that more? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. That's a tough one. I have to ask you that. If there's a way to, 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 to increase that ethic around thinking about restaurants as places not of escape, but as, as connection. And, and that too often we think about restaurants get away from you know, our harried and, and crazy lives, but, but instead we should think about them as places of connection. And I, 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 we like to underscore that. I, do, I probably don't underscore that enough at the restaurants, but that way we have four hours. Our, our average meal is about three and a half, four hours. When in the course of our day do we have the opportunity to sit at a table with a family member or, or a friend or a business associate without email, without television, without any interruptions, and, and have real connection. There's so few opportunities to do that, and restaurants really provide that. So I think there, there may be a way to look at, at, at restaurants in a different way for the future to satisfy what I think are urgent requirements for our health and happiness. Perfect. So I'm going to open it up for questions. Because it's webcast, I know it puts you a little bit on the spot, but if you could just come up here and use the microphone and ask Dan your question. And in the meantime, Suzanne, if you could get Dan a glass of water, our thanks, chef Suzanne. may be parched. Okay, thanks. Yeah, poor thanks. Suzanne. All right, who's going to ask the first question? Can okay, we bring the mic over? over? We can bring it over. No, no because this is Oh, being okay, webcast. I see. This Sorry. Is sort of I don't, wanna, I don't want to direct man. this. Hi. Hi, Emmy Simmons, uh, CSAS. Food Security Advisor. Um, I just want to follow up on this last discussion and yeah. bring Angie into it because it seems to me that one of the obvious places for people to do a for yeah for people to do a better job of sharing food and learning about deliciousness is in schools, and school cafeterias right now do not actually do that. And I'm wondering if you've thought about the notion of school meals as being part of the restorative as well as training in good manners, introducing new tastes, and kind of improving the next generation's appreciation of food. Thank you. Well, maybe I should let you take a crack at that first, and then I'll <laughs> go ahead. Well, at the Edible Schoolyard Project, that is our primary focus right yeah. now, is thinking about how we can best use, leverage the cafeteria in order to provoke large-scale system shifts. So thinking about how school lunch can not only nourish the minds and bodies of our children and enable them to thrive inside and outside the classroom, but also how school meals can have an impact on the health of our communities um, and also the health of the environment. Um, when you think about the procurement practices that we could best leverage, um, California serves about 600 million pounds of food a year to kids. Um, and if we started thinking about that as delicious food, organically grown food, um, and spaces that uplift the spirit of our children, um, provoke the sense of community. Um, when you think about the cafeteria, it's actually the one time during the day that kids from all different backgrounds, abilities, language abilities, come together in one space. So we don't have 40 or four hours. Uh, we have usually yeah, about 20 yeah, minutes. Yeah. Uh, but it is an incredible opportunity for schools to be able to build community as well as nourish their kids. Um, so if a kid is eating well in the cafeteria because they have a meal that shows care, that's delicious, um, and that provokes us into community, they're actually going to have better outcomes in the classroom. They're going to have better health outcomes as well. So school lunch is an incredible investment opportunity for this country in terms of being able to provoke um, a society that cares about each other, um, that can engage in dialogue with each other, and that is well-fed, you know, and happy. Because uh, when you eat a delicious meal, it causes you to... Uh, well, it causes you to be happy. I mean, how many times have you like had that bite? Looks like you had a good bite? lunch. I, well, yeah, I did. Uh, but, you know, when you have that bite or, you know, that yeah. one moment where you taste it and you're like, wow, that's good. Uh, we should be providing that to our kids. You know, that joy that we are able to engage with in restaurants. Like, it, wouldn't it be brilliant if our kids could engage with that every single day in the cafeteria? And imagine what that could provoke in their lives, in the lives of, you know, the teachers who are then teaching the kids in the next class period. Um, it's a brilliant experience and it's a brilliant opportunity for us to really provoke long-term changes within this country. I just, I wouldn't add it, that's beautiful. And I, the, the only thing I would say for, is personally from my experience of watching my kids now in school 
And the just bullseye opportunity, it, it strikes me as being missed here, is the, is the connection between food and lunch and the rest of the day. I just don't get it. It's like they're, they're actually in, my girls go to different schools and there's some thought put into the, to the to the lunch program that's that's a adequate, let's say. And there's some, some effort and some passion there a little bit sort of, but there's no connection to the sciences or to the arts or to learning about number. I mean, just the whole, it seems to me that it's really an opportunity to engage not just the senses, but this, this potential for learning that's being missed. And I, I don't, you know, I don't know what the lever is there to, 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 to push that through in a more profound way, but I'd love to see that happen if I was waving a wand. Yeah, Christy. Since you brought up the sciences and I gestured towards the specter of food science, specifically industrial food science in my introduction, yeah. I'm curious how you would potentially join me and others in changing the, the underlying values in how food science is practiced then. So for example, if Kenji Lopez is saying better home cooking through food science yeah. and my research is saying better food science through home cooking, what, <laughs> like, yeah. what, what is better food science in your collaboration around deliciousness? Yeah. I, I was just, as you were asking, I realized, did everyone get two pieces of bread? Because I saw only one go around. I don't know, did we get both of them? Like you got the, did you get just the oat? Yeah, are there two different kinds of bread, or are they the same? Uh, there are two different kinds of bread. There's a dark bread that's a malted uh, barley bread, and there's a whiter one that's the, that's the oat. So we need one of each to everybody. I don't know if we got that. I had plenty of slices. I got them out of the oven at 4.30 this morning. <laughs> this side got the dark bread. I think this one got the, that, exactly. Okay, who's the next questioner? Oh, well, hold on. I just, no, no. Oh, sorry, I didn't sorry. answer the question. You answered the question, sorry. <laughs> Jesus. We're going to have a time tomorrow night. No, I wanted to use the oat bread as an example to answer the question. Okay, so that's the oat bread. The oat bread's going around here. No, that's the malted bread, I think. Let me just see that. Can I see that? Yeah, yeah that's the malted barley bread. That's the barley bread. You already had the oat bread this side, I think. No? Okay. Oh, it did? Oh, okay. All right. So it's going on the other side. Okay. So uh, I just wanted to just, just take a minute to talk about the oats for, for a half a minute. The oats are a uh, unnamed variety. It's number 341 uh, from the oat breeder. And uh, the striking thing about the oats, the reason I said, yeah, okay. So there you go. On the right-hand side are the oats. You are picking up oat bread. Yep. And then the darker one is the barley. The oat bread at 85, so, so this is an oat that has 10.5% fat. And the reason I think this relates to your question is that the federal government says you are not allowed to call an oat heart healthy if it's above 5.5% fat. And that came out of the 70s and the recognition that, uh, well, the recognition, the, the, uh, the uninformed uh, science that said that any lipid, any concentration of fat above 5.5% could not be heart healthy. Now, in the in recently, last 15 years, we've obviously recognized that these lipids are, these beta-glucans are exactly what we need for not only heart health, but a whole host of antioxidant and nutritional activity that makes this oat, if it's a superfood, it's a super duper duper food at 10.5%. But the government is still saying that anything over 5.5% is not, is not healthy. And the problem with that is that breeders across the country have been breeding against the oat that you just tasted for 40 years. For 40 years. And the oat breeder that I'm talking with is 80 years old. And he remembers quite well when there were 27 million acres of oats eaten in this country. Today there's 3 million. And of the 3 million that are grown, 95% goes to animal feed, 95%. So what, so, what, so it leads me to think that in 1960, we were, we were eating this many oats because we were eating oats like this. And they were delicious. And you really didn't need to add brown sugar and, and maple syrup and cream to your oats because they had so much fat and flavor. 
And the reason I like this so much is obviously the science connection, is if we could get science and nutrition aligned, we could, do a long, we could go a long way to helping deliciousness. But think not just about the healthfulness of eating an oat that's 10.5% fat, good fat, but also think of that Klaus again, my, the farmer I talked about the, and the, the rotation. The oats that he grows goes into animal feed. Well, what if he was growing the equivalent of 27 million acres of oats? If there was a demand for oats, he could not be losing money on all those crops and dumping them into animal feed or even just plowing them into the ground. He could be selling them to us and making a fine profit on it. That's where it goes to the democratization. Because if you take the barley and you take the oats, you take the milk and the rest of it, and you create a value for it, a little bit, you have to pay a little bit more than animal feed for something this delicious. Not a lot more, by the way, not a lot more. Because remember that Venn diagram, I wouldn't be interested in the oats unless they were spectacular in their yield, and they are. And they are spectacular in their disease resistance. They really are. So this could be something that penetrates into the Walmartification of our food system easily, easily. But we need to create a demand for it, and we need the science to align. And what I, what I find particularly striking is that is that it's right there and that we could in very easily inspire food culture around this kind of flavor and give Klaus, our farmer and our organic farmers, the kind of economic return for growing these soil supporting crops, which would make the wheat that I was celebrating less expensive because the wheat, organic wheat is so expensive because all the other crops that have to go into the rotation to get the farmer to grow successfully wheat are minimized. But if we pay our fair share of the whole pie, it democratizes the cost of wheat. And that is why I'm so fixated on these other crops and not just wheat alone. But we need science to help us uh, you know, prove this and, and, and illustrate the point. Yeah. All right. I'm, uh, oh. Nadia. No, I, I know that. I was going to force you, you, you ask your question. Uh, then I have four students who are here. You'll be the second to the last question. The last question is one of my students has to stand up and ask oh, a question. It's kind okay. of a rule. OK, Chloe's already, already self-nominated in the back. Here you go. Come on up. Hi. Have I'm you eaten both slices of bread? I only had the first. Oh, I only had the dark one. Oh, the bar. Oh, you missed the oat. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll eventually have, okay. I'll eventually have the oats. Sorry. Um, I, I, had, I just had lunch, trying not to, trying not to over, o, OD on deliciousness. Um, <laughs> no such thing, but OK. So, so the, the question that I have, I mean, I've, I've noticed that um, the way that we're all talking about deliciousness here is as though there's something like self-evident and revelatory about it, right? Like if people only tasted this, oh, I'm sorry, more delicious more, more delicious food, Yeah, <laughs> they would know to want it. And I'm wondering, and it doesn't seem to me like that's necessarily the case. And so I'm wondering, um, and I should say that like Christy, I come from like a history of science background. Yeah. So I'm wondering, what's your definition of deliciousness? How does it differ from the definition of deliciousness that's created by like decades of industrial food science. Yeah. Um, and how do you, like what parts of your definition of deliciousness are missing from the industrial food science? And how do you inspire people or bring people around to, uh, to your definition of No, it's a very fair question, a really great one. And I, I, I probably skipped over some very important points that you made right there. Uh, and to, 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 to answer it as briefly as, as, as best I can is to say that I'm I'll not, warn you, she's a James Beard award-winning journalist. So I can tell. She was, she was going to ask a tough question. I yeah, no, I should differentiate between true deliciousness and fat, sugar, and salt. And so that, that is the problem with our industrialized food system and food processing, and that making the distinction between cheap calories that have additives to it and real flavors. But I still stand by the idea that if you tasted that oat bread and you, you tasted, you know, you were, you were unaccustomed to, to I, I know this just through my kids and through the restaurant and through anybody that tasted these oats, there is a, a DNA that we, are, that we are hardwired for this kind of flavor. And so I'm, I'm a big proponent of that. I don't, I don't say it's the be all and end all. And I also admit that that were stacked against in our food system, stacked against the opportunity to present these foods to a wider audience. So, 
I agree with the premise of what you're saying, but I, the only part I would push back on is that you need to, you need to educate people <laughs> about what is really delicious because I think that comes from simply tasting something that is unadulterated and true. That's been my experience. It might be a little, <laughs> might be a little Pollyannish. I don't know. We'll see. All right, Chloe, you got to come up here. So Chloe is one of my four GW students who are here. I may have switched institutions, Arizona State University, but will be forever loyal to my great students. And Chloe has done some wonderful stuff in wasted food, among yeah. other things. So, Hi, Chloe. Hello. Thank you so much for this talk. This is awesome. Um, so yeah, I actually worked in, you know, working with classrooms for a long time to engage students in food waste reduction in the cafeteria and then taking that science into the classroom and then also recently, you know, uh, founded a startup that is working with restaurants to combat food waste by selling it. So I'm curious, as you as a chef, how do you engage with consumers in this issue and, and you know, not just engage them on the sustainability aspect, but actually get them to focus on the issue of food waste and specifically what messaging do you find is effective? Because we all know it doesn't help when someone tells you finish your, finish your plate of food. So what do you find is most effective? Yeah, I like... I have to say that this is really difficult um, in the sense that no one wants to be told how to eat. Um, but also I find the whole premise of food waste and the way that it's talked about really upsetting in the sense that it, it is distilled down to ugly fruits and vegetables and finish your plate of food. So that if you finish your plate of food and you go for the, 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 the scarred fruits, you are somehow relieved or somehow um, uh, anointed as a chef or as a consumer uh, to be conscious of this issue. When really the bigger waste is just our expectation for a plate of food, a six or seven ounce piece of protein that centers our plates twice a day, lunch and dinner, seven days a week, is simply the most wasteful diet in the history of the world. And if we don't get away from that, everything else we're talking about is, is it's, just, it's just scraps, it's nothing. So I, I created the wasted pop-up with, with the restaurant with Blue Hill to talk about what I think are the more, the more difficult issues to talk about, uh, but to do it in the context of pleasure and delight and hedonism, which is what this should be. Uh, and that's about serving delicious oats and delicious parts of animals that we otherwise don't covet uh, and bring them into the food culture in a way that we haven't in this country uh, over the last 50 years. So I don't have a magic bullet to this and I'm probably the, the worst person to ask because I, I, end up, I end up pontificating rather than <laughs> simply inspiring. And we really should be an army of virtue rather than, you know, rather than a team of, of pontificators. So um, I have a lot to learn on this, but um, thanks to Kathleen's assistance and guidance, I'm getting there. Sure. Thanks. All right, for those of you who are online, thank you very much for joining us. For those of you in the room, uh, there's food and drink available to all. And thank you for coming and let's thank our great chef. Thank you, thank you.